Hey, this is Russ Anderson. Over the years, I've seen a lot of people try and do shots that look like this, where they want to track a flat object, call it an iPad, say, or a phone, or whatever, and add some sort of 2D or 3D graphics to it. And that presents a challenge, technically, because the object is flat. Everything is flat in a single plane. It's really 2D. So you can't pull 3D information out of something that's intrinsically 2D without a bit of extra work. So the extra work that you need to do is to give Synthize coordinates for each of the points. Now here you see that I've got points laid out in the grid, so I've got nine total points. You can get away with as few as four points, just the corners, say, but if you do that, then generally you're going to need to already have figured out the field of view of the camera and give Synthize that field of view value as a known value. Of course, the other problem, if you've only got four points, is that as soon as the talent goes and puts their hand in front of something, you're, you're out to lunch. So using some additional points is a great idea. Now here I made a mock iPad by tracing an iPad onto a piece of foam core. You can see it's a nice matte green color. Uh, the matte nature of this is really important when you've got a flat surface and you don't want to be picking up all the lights all of a sudden. And having done that, then I laid out these points by cutting a piece of paper in an old-fashioned paper cutter to be a 5-inch by 7-inch uh, rectangular piece of paper, which I then put onto my mock iPad and uh, marked the corners. Then I just used a ruler to measure out the points in the middle and used the diagonals to put something in the center. Now you could do some additional points here if you had uh, even more action going on and you were worried about more of the points being blocked. Obviously that makes a few more points to track and to uh, enter coordinates for. Now here I've used some Avery dots for each of the little points here and you can see I've used red dots and if I had a really a better choice I would have just used something that was darker or perhaps lighter. It's, it's a lot better idea to use a different intensity value than a different color. It works better with the cameras. Here again I wanted to stay with something that had a matte finish so that uh, I wouldn't have problems with uh, reflections from lights. Now if we go and take a look at this uh, whole sequence You'll see that uh, for some parts of it, there's some really severe blur. And again, I needed more light to uh, be able to get the shutter time down. So I really didn't have that handy. So instead, I'm going to have to track this. It's going to take some extra time, but it's, it's going to be very doable. If you look around some more, you'll see some trails. You know, here are trails behind the dots as they're moving. And those aren't optical effects, those are actually remnants of the coding, the MPEG style coding that the camera is using. So if, if you have a system that's, that's able to do a better job with compression, you won't uh, have that problem. You know, ideally you want something that uses only intra-frame compression. So that's our, our basic setup here. We've got a piece of foam core, it uh, gets picked up, moved around a little and then flung back onto the table and we want to track it in 3D and you'll notice that the camera itself is stationary certainly we could have the camera moving as well and we could track that at the same time that would make for a somewhat more complicated example so now we're ready to do some tracking now just a warning this is going to be really really tedious we're going to do it all as supervised tracking hey welcome to tracking so the first thing that you need to know is that we're going to need a really big search area because obviously the, uh, the thing's moving around all over the place. So uh, let's bump that up. Obviously, I've taken a look at some of these values earlier. Uh, so we're just going to roll them up. These are some halfway decent numbers. And we're going to use, we'll start down here. We're going to use a symmetric mode tracker. And you notice I'm going to be using uh, a lot of 
little mouse motions and uh, keyboard keys to do this. We're really interested in getting the work done. I'll try and give you an idea of what I'm doing as I go along. Some of it you may have to go look in the manual and see what it was that I did. And, you know, there's a lot of that stuff, and you can look on the keyboard manager. It has a whole list of commands. So that was a right click to get to the symmetric mode. And uh, we're going to go and we're going to use this uh, handheld sticky mode because uh, the thing's moving around a bit randomly, especially when it's flying through the air. So uh, we, don't, we don't want it to be trying to predict too much where it's going to be going next. So with this symmetric mode, there's no need to have a uh, key reset periodically since the uh, this this kind of tracker doesn't use that it rekeys automatically um, here I was using the mouse mode the mouse wheel to, to go forward now I'm just using the uh, what is it the D key and now when you go and it starts flying through the air you'll see it goes flying off here so it needs to be back down here and I could move it around over here let's do that once and the other approach is now just to go and you hold down the Z key and just drop it into place. Now we'll go and start using D to move forward. And you can see how exciting this is. And we'll just tweak this up. And we need to get back into a area where it's not moving around so fast. Then we've got it. And we can just... Uh, it, that's the plus key, I guess, on the numeric pad. So we've got our first tracker tracked. Great news, we've got uh, eight more to go. So here we go, there we're on place. Same routine, let's go see where it gets lost. And there we go again. Now you see here's the hand going in front, so we need to pay a little more attention. We can actually go and pick out a couple more frames. You can see the hand moving by really rapidly gets so blurred out that you can still actually see. but eventually we just lose it. So we turn the tracker off, that's the E key, and let's roll forward a bit more. Shows up just for a couple of frames, it's not really worth picking up, it's just more apt to create a glitch. And now here I just dragged in the tracker view, which turned the tracker back on and let me reposition it. And now we're back on location. Here he goes flying off again. You notice that I'm hitting basically the center of the tracker, you know, the blurred spot. It's actually possible to systematically use either the beginning or the end if you want to be fancy about it. But the trick is then if you're going to do that, then you have to be consistent for all the trackers. And that's generally tricky and doesn't necessarily accomplish too much. It might affect how your motion blur is doing when you're rendering matching footage though. So there we go, we've got another tracker. That's shift A to get back to the beginning. Oh, that's interesting. So I had botched my one guy up for some reason. So let's just turn him around the other way so that we get the full length there. So, you know, that's that's reality. So here we go with our next guy. Oops, he needs to turn back in the right direction now.
Okay, so that's uh, a bunch of them that we've done. Let's now go and we're going to start using the ones that we've already done to help guide what happens with the ones that we're adding. So let's see how that goes. Of course, we still have to worry about when they get blocked. And still you see that when the image changes really, really rapidly, it's, it's apt to look for something different. Again, this is just using Z drop to put it right right back in place. And there we go. So you got the end is in sight here. This guy is getting a bit blurred out. I want to point, this, point out this would be a bit easier on a bigger screen here. I got to keep the uh, capture window a bit small. The bigger the screen, sort of the more you can see at the same time. So, as we said, it, it takes a little time. Not exactly the world's most exciting thing, but uh, it's the way it goes. So now let's just take a quick look at things. I've opened up the graph editor, and let's pop on over, and we'll select all the trackers, and you know, we're looking for anything that looks way too glitchy, and I'm not seeing anything offhand. So I think we've got our tracking nailed down. Now we're ready to do the soft to determine the motion of the tablet. 
the first thing that we have to recognize is that so far we're only really set up for a camera solve. If we did a solve now, we get the motion of the camera moving around with respect to the tablet with the tablet standing still. So that's not what we want. Instead, we want to add a moving object. So now all the trackers are on the camera still and nothing's on the object. So let's flip back to the camera. We'll go to the coordinate system panel, select all our trackers and move them to the object. Let me just get them there. The other thing that we need to do is disable the camera because it doesn't have any trackers on it. Now, if the camera had been moving during this shoot, as well as the tablet itself, we could have solved for the camera motion as well. And in that case, we'd have additional trackers that are on the, the background and not on the tablet and those trackers would be attached to the camera and we would do a camera solve. So we, we can do the solve for both the camera and the tablet simultaneously, but that's not what we've got in this particular shot. So we'll just disable the camera and we'll go work on the object itself. So back here on the coordinate system setup panel, we need to enter the coordinates for these trackers. And, you know, that is necessary because they're all flat on a plane. So we're just going to start out. We're going to ultimately have this center point be 0, 0. And that's going to be the origin of the coordinate system for the tablet. And if you recall that points were laid out using a 5 inch by 7 inch a rectangle. So that makes this first point be sitting down here at minus 2.5, minus minus three and a half. The next one over here is at zero and minus three and a half. And this one here is going to be at plus two and a half and minus three and a half. This row here is all going to be y of zero. So it's minus two and a half. And this one here is going to be plus two and a half. And this row up here is all going to be plus three and a half in Y. So we should be good here. So if we were doing a whole bunch of these shots, we could actually put those coordinates in a file. And just by always creating the trackers in the specific same order, we could just read in those coordinate values from a file using this uh, file import tracker locations. And so that would let us set up a bunch of shots pretty easily without having to manually enter all of the uh, data each time. But with that data entered, now we need to tell Synthize what to do with that. So we're going to select all the trackers and set those to be lock points. We want those coordinates to be used directly. And we're also going to use the coordinate data as the basis for the initial solution using the from seed point uh, solving method. So we set all the points to be seeds. Now we go over here to the solver. And again, we're going to tell it to use the from seed points mode. And now we're ready to go do the solve. And we got a, a nice solution immediately. And you see here the tablet is moving around nicely with respect to the camera. The camera itself hasn't moved because it's disabled. So it's just sitting in its initial location. But we've got the uh, null moving around with the overall tablet in 3D. So let's go over to the 3D panel and we're going to switch to object coordinate mode and let's create first a little plane and now a little earthling to sit 
right smack in the middle of this thing. So, you know, that earthling is a good way to see whether you've got the orientation of the tablet right, just because it's sticking up so high that any small errors in orientation will show a motion in the head and the hand up at the top. So let's go over to the perspective view for a second, and we can tweak this up a little bit just to adjust our tablet. Let's see. Maybe needs to be a little bit narrower. A little bit longer. And we can go and just switch over to local coordinate system handles if it uh, isn't located right. We can move it around as needed. So now we've got a nice little plane moving around. We've got a guy sitting up on top. Now one other thing that it would be nice to do, if we go back and look at the quad view, uh, let's turn off our object mode. You know, as I said, we, we initially have the camera just at its default position, and the object is moving around with respect to that. Um, so everything matches up perfectly, and we could add a whole bunch of different effects in here uh, very nicely. If we wanted to have a gravity-based effect, though, uh, that wouldn't really work out so well because it isn't positioned correctly in the overall 3D environment to have gravity go in the right direction. So what we can do is actually move the whole scene around to line up with the overall coordinate system. And I'm going to show you a cool way to do that. One way to do it would be to use this whole button and move, move everything around as a unit manually. Um, that would be kind of a drag and not so accurate. So let's let's do it a more interesting way instead and much more accurate way. So to do that, we're going to go to the perspective view. We're going to position the, uh, you know, keep the frame at one where, you know, the where the tablet's sitting flat on the table. That's what we where we want to align it. And I'm going to bring up a menu item you're not going to be able to see, unfortunately. Uh, all the way down here in the grid menu, there, there's actually a bunch of nested menus. So I'm going to go into the grid, go all the way to the bottom. There's object mode grids, and within the object mode grid submenu, there's another item which says upward facing object grid. And I'm going to select that upward facing object grid. So you see what that did? That moved the perspective views grid which is just a, a convenient construction grid, and align it with the coordinate system of the object. Now the other thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell it, I'm going to switch to the camera as the active object, and I'm going to tell it, again in this grid view, I'm going to select an item called Make Grid the Ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the entire scene to match up so that this grid here in the perspective view is now the overall system coordinate system ground. So I'm going to hit Make Grid the Ground. Nothing really happened from that view. But we go back over to the quad perspective view. And now, presto, you see that the camera is up above. The iPad's sitting on the table. We lift it up, we do stuff to it, and we put it back down on the table. So that's the placement we want. Now, before when I created the, uh, the little guy and the plane, they were sitting on the, you know, the uh, object was sitting, was selected up here. So the plane and the man were parented to the moving object. Now if I go and do the same thing, I'm going to create another plane. And I'm going to create another guy. 
and we'll just put him out here somewhere. Now you get an overall scene. You see the one guy is standing on the table, the other guy gets picked up, and so on. We'll go and we'll go to normal speed. And we go to the camera. With this camera tab, the, uh, the playback won't loop. So there's our overall shot. So it's pretty cool. I understand that uh, Apple actually has the iPad 42 currently in development. So I'm expecting to see you all have some viral videos on YouTube pretty soon that shows us exactly what that iPad 42 is going to look like. Thanks a lot. Enjoy.